run our project Battle for the Constitution, which is a series of essays that look at the biggest uh, constitutional questions facing America today. I'm joined by Jeff Rosen, the head of the National Constitution Center, and Ted Olson, the former Solicitor General of the United States. Uh, and we're gonna be talking about the Supreme Court's recent term. I wanna start by opening up to both of you with kind of a big picture assessment of where you think the court went this term. Uh, let's start with you, Jeff, because you just wrote for me on this very question of the Chief Justice uh, this term and how he navigated the court through some really difficult and controversial questions, also at a time where uh, the court's institutional legitimacy uh, is felt by some people to be at risk. Yes, the piece argued that this is the term that John Roberts made the Supreme Court his own. Some have called him the most powerful and effective chief since Charles Evans Hughes in 1937. And the reason that's right is because he put institutional legitimacy front and center. I had an incredible opportunity to interview the chief at the end of his first term in 2006. And he told me then exactly what he ended up doing now. He said that he believed that this was a polarized time, that citizens were viewing the branches of government in partisan terms, and it was urgently important that they see the court as an institution that rose above politics and was motivated by principle and law rather than partisanship. And he did that in case after case, both in constructing these remarkable bipartisan majorities in cases involving presidential subpoenas and in the LGBT rights case. Uh, he also joined the liberals in important five to four cases involving DACA, which Ted Olson won and will tell us about such an important victory, as well as others. But mostly the chief showed that he's more interested in having citizens embrace the legitimacy of the court than he is in methodological purity or in any particular approach to interpretation. And in the process, he achieved something that he wasn't sure he could when he started off. He said, you know, most chief justices have been failures. And by embracing the model of his hero, Chief Justice John Marshall, he really achieved his vision. Um, and Ted, do you share Jeff's assessment? Is that kind of your big picture understanding of where the court is now? I agree with Jeff. Uh, he makes some very, very important points. This was, it's important to understand this was a shortened term uh, because of the COVID epidemic or pandemic. Uh, the court decided, I think, 57 cases. It's usually every term 65 to 75. So this was a smaller number of cases. But I also counted up 16 or 17 or more cases that I thought were very significant cases. The, um, more than I can remember of any recent term of the Supreme Court. There were cases involving abortion, guns, individual rights, LGBT rights, the rights of DACA persons. There were, I think, uh, 12, um, five to four decisions from the Supreme Court and the Chief Justice participated uh, in the majority on 11 of those 12 cases, he wrote for the court, as Jeff just said, the cases involving the uh, president's tax returns. He wrote for the court the DACA decision. He joined the court in the abortion case. He wrote for the court in, in, uh, involving uh, tuition uh, credits for religious schools. Uh, so the number of cases where he actually wrote for the court or joined the court in a key way uh, was re quite remarkable, and Jeff is absolutely right. He is right at the center. He was, was, it seems to have assisted in controlling in a major way the outcome of where the Supreme Court came out, and it, the, many of these decisions did surprise people, um, but as some of the commentators that I've read about in uh, various publications have said, it's remarkable how closely the Supreme Court came to public opinion uh, in terms of, for example, the LGBT rights, where the court may have not have come out that way a few years ago. And this case was written by Justice Gorsuch, a conservative, and yet the American public pretty much understands that that is the right place to come out. So it's a very interesting term for the Supreme Court and particularly for the Chief Justice. What were you surprised by in the term? I was, well, I was encouraged. Um, I had 
I had argued, as Jeff pointed out, the DACA case, which involved the lives of 700,000 individuals who had been brought to this country when they were children. They were given the opportunity to have deferred status in terms of deportation and enforcement of immigration laws by President Obama. Now, it could have been easy for the court to say, well, President Obama put this program in, in place without legislative support. The next president can take it away. So it was very difficult to argue that while the president might have had the opportunity and legality and power to change that decision, that it was nonetheless wrong because of the way in which it was done. So we argued very, very hard to make the point that when the government makes a decision, even if it has the power to make that decision, it must do it in the right way. It must substantiate what it's deciding and must explain what it's deciding, and it had not done so. So I was very gratified because as I was, uh, I was saying to Jeff a little short while ago, I kept thinking about those people and their families and taking away their right to work, to support their families and to support their children, and how sad it would be if we did that to those individuals. So this was a very, very important decision to me and a little bit of a surprise, although we hoped all along that we would win the case, you always have to cross your fingers when it's that close. And it came out five to four in a case written by the Chief Justice saying, indeed, the government has to square corners when it's making decisions. Uh, the DACA decision, I, I'd love to hear more from you about it. It's one of those cases where the human consequences of the decision are just so apparent. Uh, as you're saying, 700,000 individuals whose lives are going to be directly affected. I'm curious just if you can tell us in a, a story what it was like for you waiting for the decision to come down and what, what your response was when you did hear what the decision was. Yes, um, first we argued the case in November and we didn't get the decision until just a week or so ago. Um, I spent time with the DACA recipients, the dreamers, before the argument. I wanted to know their stories. I wanted to know them as people. Uh, and I spent time with a lot of them with their, and, and learned about their families, what it would mean if they lost this case, lost the ability to work, lost the ability to get driver's licenses. One, uh, one of the dreamers had become a lawyer uh, and we arranged for him to be admitted to the Supreme Court bar. He was the first Dreamer, DACA recipient, to become a member of the Supreme Court bar. And he sat next to me at the council table in the United States Supreme Court. We were sending the strongest possible uh, signal to the justices. So I learned about those individuals and I kept thinking, I have got to win this case. How am I going to win this case? Uh, and then once we argued the case and we're waiting for months for the decision, it, uh, a, not a day went by when I did not think, what is going to happen to these individuals? Are they going to be exposed to deportation to countries they don't understand? Can they be deported and their, their children who are citizens of the United States be torn away from them because they're sent to another country? Oh, I kept thinking there are many medical workers during this time of medical crisis who are helping save lives. These were individuals serving in the army. So I could go on and on and on, but the human stories were multiple and it wasn't just 700,000 individuals. It was their families, it was their communities, it was their jobs. Uh, and many corporations filed briefs saying, don't do this, save these people. They're vital to us, they're an important part. This is their country, and they are the embodiment, in many respects, of the American dream over and over again. So I felt that very, very strongly and very compellingly. And when the decision came down, what, what was that like for you? Well, I was, I was elated, and I was enormously relieved uh, because uh, we could say to these individuals, uh, we've saved this decision uh, and your lives are not going to be uprooted. Who knows what might happen in the future with Congress and the administration because the, the administration might have the power to change this thing, but for now, things are okay. Jeff, I'd like to move um, our conversation over from kind of the most maybe human-centered of the decisions to 
two of the most institutional, which were the Mazars and Vance cases that came down right at the end of the term. Uh, what, did you, what do you see the court's answer to these big institutional questions facing the relationship of, facing the country about the relationship of the branches and uh, uh, the powers of the presidency? Well, both cases were a remarkable embrace, actually by nearly all the justices, although they disagreed about the reasoning, that the president is not above the law. That is a basic principle. It got a unanimous court in the U.S. v. Nixon case and, and in the Clinton case. And what was significant here is Chief Justice Roberts narrowed the issue to one that a majority of justices could join, and then they could split off and take their different decisions. So uh, it was highly significant that in the congressional subpoenas case, the court crafted for the first time in history a kind of multi-part test for when Congress could get disputed information. Only Justices Alito and Thomas dissented. And in the New York uh, case involving uh, Cyrus Vance, uh, the question was also, uh, the president has to abide by ordinary grand jury rules, and we're not going to create a special one. Again, Justices Alito and Thomas were the only dissenters, and, and Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh would have had a slightly higher standard. What's so significant here is that the chief persuaded the liberal as well as the conservative justices to converge around a standard that was not obvious from the oral argument. And, and you asked, of course, Becca, was it a surprise? Uh, many of us could not tell from the oral arguments, which were held for the first time by telephone, where the justices stood. The questions, the questions took place in order of seniority, unlike the usual free-for-all. Uh, they were pretty scrupulous about examining both sides. And no, in, in retrospect, it's easy to say, of course, the court would stand up for institutional legitimacy, but that was not obvious from the oral argument. So that has to be a tribute, not only to the chief's determination to have a multi-partisan majorities, but also to his fellow justices. And that's the really crucial lesson of this term. After all, Chief Justice Roberts has been trying to stress institutional legitimacy ever since he began, but he's had mixed success, I think everyone would uh, agree, including him. And when we talked, he said, it'll depend on my colleagues. Are they going to embrace this vision? This was the term that everyone embraced the vision. And it was very significant that the liberal justices joined the conservatives not only in the subpoena case, in giving both sides a result that wasn't exactly what either wanted, but also in two religious liberty cases, to, mm -hmm. to see uh, Justices Breyer and Kagan joining the conservatives in agreeing that uh, religious schools could get public funds on equal terms to non-religious schools, and also that the conscience or ministerial exemption to having to provide Obamacare or contraceptive coverage could be expanded. Um, that was a tribute to the fact that these two pragmatic justices, Justices Kagan and Breyer, chair Chief Justice Roberts's concern about institutional legitimacy. And let's just pause for a second. I mean, it's, it's important to parse the cases, but this is a time when the legitimacy of all three branches of the federal government are under siege. Many citizens are questioning the very existence of the presidency and Congress as institutions that are more than partisan uh, engines. And the justices are obviously concerned that their own legitimacy not be similarly contested. So that's why you see these important crossovers. Everyone is playing ball. And that's why you also have such a remarkable decision like the LGBT rights case, where Justice Gorsuch is so principled in applying his textualist methodology and, and all the other justices buy into it, even though they may not have the same methodology, but they agree with the results. So there's something in the air. It's pretty obvious what it is. It's the very uh, future of democracy and the, the legitimacy of the other branches of government. And it was something very meaningful to see the Supreme Court operate as a court, as the chief likes to put it, where both sides are embracing results that don't give everyone everything that they want, but do shore up the legitimacy of the court in the process. Can I add something, Becca? It's a footnote sure. to what Jeff said at the beginning about Chief Justice Roberts and his admiration for Chief Justice Marshall, who was the fourth Chief Justice, but who served for 34 years and changed the institution of the judiciary and the Supreme Court. The key case is Marbury versus Madison. That's the beginning of all of this for Justice Marshall. He gave to Justice to President um, Jefferson the, the ability not to have the um, appointees of, of President Adams stay on the court 
Um, and he gave that victory to Jefferson, but at the same moment, he seized for the Supreme Court and for the judiciary, the power to review and decide that laws of Congress are unconstitutional. So in a sense, he rendered a brilliant decision, in my opinion, that, but, and Jefferson was mad about the judicial review part of it, but he, but he won the case in the sense that the judges that he didn't want on the bench weren't on the bench. This decision in the Trump tax things was something of the same thing. Trump lost, but he won. He lost in the sense that the Supreme Court reaffirmed what Jeff said, no president is above the law. They, they were arguing that he was. I don't know why they made such an extreme argument, but they lost that. The Trump administration lost that point, and the American people won that point. At the same time, in both cases, the case went back to the earlier lower courts and the Trump papers, the records, tax materials are not being produced. They're not going to be produced before the election. And if they do get to the grand jury in New York, the public is not going to see them before the election. So Trump is first of all, railed against the court's decision. And then he sort of softened up as soon as he realized, mm -hmm. hey, I won. I, there, my, my tax returns aren't going to be put out. It's not so much how important that is, but the, but the, the uh, ju <clears throat> jujitsu that is in a sense that the court did was very reminiscent of what Chief Justice Marshall did in Marbury versus Madison. Judicial jujitsu is a perfect phrase for what um, Marshall did and what Chief Justice Roberts did. And it's really important to stress how, how openly the Chief Justice embraces John Marshall as a hero. He notes Marshall's uh, phrase, I'm not fond of butting my head against a wall as if in sport. In other words, don't pick fights you can't win. And that's why Ted is absolutely right that he affirmed the principle that the president isn't above the law while not really picking out a direct fight with the president. And he also, Chief Justice Roberts, took from his hero, uh, Chief Justice Marshall, the idea that narrow unanimous opinions are far more important for judicial legitimacy than divided broad ones. And he notes that Chief Justice Marshall took one of the most embattled uh, branches of government, one so disrespected that, um, as Ted noted, a bunch of chiefs kept resigning because they didn't even think it was worth being chief. They'd rather run for governor or state office. Uh, and he made it one of the most powerful and effective branches by persuading his colleagues to work together, by stressing what Chief Justice Roberts called the team dynamic. Well, that's a good setup for my final question here, which is that you wrote in your piece, and as you're saying now, that a lot of the uh, coherence that the chief uh, achieved was via having very narrow decisions. And I'm wondering, do you think that that's what we can expect to see from the court going forward, or are these a prelude to a new era? First of all, it all depends on the current balance of the court staying the same. As Ted noted earlier, the, the, the chief is uh, at, at the center of the court, he's both the median and the swing justice. And I gather that no chief has played that role, perhaps since Hughes. So Roberts's only power, as he told me when we talked, is the power to either write the decision himself or assign it to the justice he thinks best reflects his views when he's in the majority. So he used that power to either write narrow decisions when he was in the majority or to give it to justices uh, like Justice Gorsuch, who may have written more broadly, but he knew could get bipartisan buy-in. If uh, uh, the composition of the court changes, all that goes out the window. If the President Trump wins and a liberal justice is replaced by a conservative, uh, Roberts is no longer swing. You've got five very solid conservative votes and perhaps no incentive to compromise. If uh, Biden wins and the uh, the composition remains the same. Roberts can keep playing that role, but there's, you know, talk of court packing in the air and uh, all sorts of possibilities of uh, trying to fight off other challenges to the current composition of the court. So it's an extremely delicate, precarious place, which Roberts realizes, and his willingness to do it depends on the balance remaining as it is, and also on his colleagues being similarly determined to cooperate with him. And much of that will be determined, as Ted noted, both by the broader currents of public opinion and also the reaction of the political branches. Is that your assessment as well, Ted? 
it is, and I was thinking as Jeff was speaking, um, that at, at the point that Jeff was making about the Chief Justice's ability to dis, assign the, dis, the writing of the opinion, and in the Bostic case, which was a, one of three cases involving LGBT rights, he assigned that opinion writing to Justice Gorsuch. Justice Gorsuch then joined with the Chief Justice and the four liberal members of the court in deciding in a very, very important case, the rights of LGBT citizens to be treated fairly decently and without discrimination. He could have assigned that to any one of the liberal members of the court. He didn't. He assigned it to Justice Gorsuch. And Justice Gorsuch, a conservative, wrote with originalism, um, uh, looking at the statute and deciding it on an originalist basic, wrote the decision for the 6-3 court. That's very significant. Justice Gorsuch had um, a principal role also in the major case involving Indians. Uh, he had a role in other cases. Um, and um, it was interesting that um, Justice Kavanaugh, who's the newest member of the court, agreed with the Chief Justice something like 92% in 92% of the cases. That was the closest pairing of any of the justices. But Justice Gorsuch, the second newest member of the court, was the one that sort of departed from the, the conservative side. Uh, and it was true last year, too. He departed from the so-called conservative position more often than any of uh, any of the conservative members of the of his colleagues chief just uh, justice thomas and justice alito were together almost all of the time many times dissenting so it was an interesting pairing there with what the chief justice was doing how he brought along kavanaugh with him and then joined the liberals in some of these more important decisions and the key vote, one more thing, the key vote in the abortion case was, was, was written by Chief Justice uh, Roberts, who had dissented in a similar case just a couple of years ago. And at this time, he came out in the, si the side of the majority that he was against a couple of years ago, citing stare decisis, citing the rule of the precedent of the court. And I have a feeling very strongly that he's writing that uh, dissenting opinion on abortion, uh, the concurring opinion on abortion, sending a message about the importance of precedent in future Supreme Court decisions. I think you'll see that again and again. And that was a very important statement by him. Thank you both so much. That was a fascinating assessment of the court and it leaves us all with so much to think about uh, in the months ahead. I, I really appreciate your time and um, insight here. And just thank you, this was great. Thank you, Becca. Thank you, Becca, and thanks for the great work you're doing running the Battle for the Constitution website and our listeners should check it out. It's just a source of light and learning about the Constitution. So thank you for that.